Rebecca, and uh, it is an absolute pleasure to be standing here in front of everybody today, and uh, nice to see some of the freshman relatives again after our amazing trip to uh, to Norway a few weeks ago, which uh, it was uh, an amazing experience for me and my my good wife, who's sitting at the back there as well. Um, uh, before I get into the description of Operation Freshman, uh, which uh, is truly a, a an epic tale I would like to uh, describe it as uh, tragic, um, but, but, but epic. Uh, I want to tell you a little bit about uh, the, uh, the project, I spent two minutes on, on, on that. And, uh, and uh, people always say, well, how did you get into this, Bruce? Uh, what's, what's your connection? And uh, I've always been interested in military history all through my life. Um, both my grandfathers served during the Second World War, although they never talked about it like, uh, like many. Um, but uh, I was always interested in military history and particularly Second World War. And uh, uh, when I moved to Norway to work in the oil industry, um, I started to dig into the connection between Norway and the UK during the war and particularly the heavy water um, uh, actions. And, uh, and it was really when uh, Joyce and I were uh, looking at the Commonwealth graves in Stavanger and you see all of these graves with the same date and the same unit, and that tells you something dramatic has, has actually occurred, and, uh, and that's really where, where it started. So um, that happened a few years ago, but uh, obviously I was working uh, pretty much full-time at that time, and it wasn't until I took early retirement uh, about three years ago that uh, I have dedicated my time pretty much full-time, Joyce would say more than full-time, <laughs> um, to, uh, to the Operation Freshman project. And, so, uh, and that's what brought me here today on... Uh, very close to the actual day that the men took off from Skitton Airfield in the north of Scotland heading for Norway. Uh, uh, during the course of the project, one of the, one of the things I was really keen to do was to tell the story of the guys who took part, all these uh, brave young men. And, uh, and so I started to go onto the Ancestry databases and uh, I'm a master of Google and Excel, uh, having worked in the oil industry. And, um, and uh, to this date, uh, I've managed to trace the families of 37 of the 48 young men who, who, who took part. I would dearly love to find the remaining 11. Um, that, would be, uh, that would be amazing. Uh, one new family appeared just a week ago, thanks to the efforts of one of the other freshman families, the Sewells. And, uh, and I'll be meeting them next week um, at the Army Flying Museum. So I'm still working on that, but, uh, but my main aim now, after having done the, uh, the uh, trip to Norway for, for the freshman relatives, we had 67 family members for uh, just over a week visiting the crash sites and the graves and the execution sites and so on. Amazing experience. I'm sure the families, if you talk to any of them, they will, they will share that view. Um, but now I need to focus on the book, which I plan to get finished by, by next summer. So that's, that's, that's my plan. But if anybody is interested in knowing more about it, my email is there. You can, you can contact me. And if you can help me find any of the remaining 11, I would be eternally grateful because I do, I do want to, to, uh, to, to finish this project, not having left anyone out if I can possibly, possibly manage. So Operation Freshman, the first uh, Allied Gliderborne raid of World War II. And uh, uh, it's... When you look at what the plans were, and I'll talk about these in detail uh, a little bit later, when you look at what the plans were and uh, how challenging and technically difficult this operation was, uh, the fact that it was even launched is, sometimes is amazing. Um, and, uh, and as I say, hopefully I'll, I'll manage to, to, to give you a flavor of that. But this was the very first time, and it was... It was Nighttime tow, it was long distance, it's trying to find a pinprick in the dark in the Norwegian mountains. Uh, just the fact it was even attempted showed how important this raid was seen to be. Uh, otherwise, you would never, ever attempt something so, so risky using technology that was not tried and tested. Um, but, uh, but it was seen as, as so crucial, and that's, that's why it was launched. But it's important to remember how high risk and difficult this, this actual challenge was. The very first, first raid using, uh, using gliders. So the background was, was really that uh, there, there's been a lot of pre-war uh, research and development on, uh, on nuclear energy. And, uh, and uh, both Britain and Germany 
um, were very, very active in this field. And, uh, and they, uh, both Britain and Germany, were the ones who saw the real importance of heavy water as, uh, as, uh, as, as, as part of this development. So, uh, so there was a lot of research, and interestingly, there was a lot of communication between scientists, as there, as there always is in a non-wartime situation. Lots of conferences and lots of uh, people getting together and talking about this. So it was, it was, I think that that's one of the reasons that the, 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 the Allies, particularly the British, were so concerned about this development, because they, they knew that the Germans were essentially working on the same lines as they were. And, and that's why heavy water became such, uh, such an interest. Uh, at that time, the, uh, the only real source uh, on an industrial scale was the uh, Weimark plant in, in, in Norway. Um, the uh, the uh, Norsk Hydro facility wasn't there to develop heavy water. That was, that, that was a byproduct. It, it was really a hydrogen factory, and the hydrogen was being produced using the hydroelectric power. Uh, for, the, for that uh, facility, and then the hydrogen was then pumped to another facility further down the valley, and it was all to do with making fertilizers. So that, that was the purpose of it. The heavy water was a byproduct, and, uh, and, uh, and in fact, they were trying to find a market for it, trying to find out how it could be actually used commercially, because they were making it, but they didn't actually know what to do with it. Um, but as I say, it was seen to be something that, that uh, was important for, uh, for, uh, for developing uh, uh, nuclear research. And, uh, and uh, after the occupation in 1940, uh, the Germans obviously took over the uh, facility and they immediately ordered a huge ramp up in production. And it's that which led to ultimately to Operation Freshman and, and also the Operation Gunner side, which, which followed. Uh, the Allies became extremely concerned as to why they were suddenly asking for such an increase in capacity. And uh, there were people who worked there, uh, Professor uh, Leif Tronsta, who was uh, one of the originators in setting this up. He escaped over to the UK and he worked actively uh, in, in the UK all through the war until he was tragically killed near the end. But, uh, but they, 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 uh, they, they uh, told the Allies about this increase in production and everybody started to get really worried. Well, what are they doing with it? Where is it going? And uh, there are so many documents in the National Art how this could be done. Um, bombing was obviously uh, considered, but bombing is a real challenge um, in, in this area uh, for many reasons. One, to get hold of bombers and aircrew to do it. Uh, Bomber Command was not a fan of combined operations uh, during the war. Uh, particularly in the early stages, they did not want to divert any bombing capacity or crews, experienced crews, to take part in something like this. So to get actual a raid would have been hard anyway to get the, the men and machines to do it. But it's a difficult target. It's a pinpoint target. It's in a very deep, narrow-sided valley. The Germans had stretched cables across the valley to prevent any low-level attack. And uh, they were aiming for a very small facility in a very you know, quite a big factory complex. And, uh, and there were a lot of uh, civilian uh, locals in the vicinity. The town of Rukan is, is close by, so there's always a risk of, of civilian casualties. So bombing was considered, and it was dropped. Um, of course, the, the Americans in 1944, they went ahead and did it anyway. And uh, they sent a large number of, uh, of uh, bombers uh, to the facility. They bombed it, they missed the actual target, and they killed a whole bunch of civilians. Um, so uh, the decision not to bomb was, was probably a wise one uh, at that time um, because the pinpoint accuracy, as, you, as all of you know, was not fantastic. And to try and hit a room in a factory, um, not being able to fly in low level, you, you, you're not going to make it. So then the other options were considered were internal sabotage, so try and persuade some of the workers in the factory to, uh, to do something. Well, that's not really a very good option. Um, uh, if you imagine the repercussions on the local population, if it was discovered that some of the, uh, the local workers in the, uh, in the hydroelectric plant had actually planted explosive, um, uh, it was never a starter. Plus, you need so much explosives to actually take out that target. So that was never really an option. They did look at bringing in a, a special operations executive team and infiltrate in there and do a similar thing. But again, you had the problem of the volume of explosives that were needed and also the risk to, uh, to the civilians afterwards and the reprisals, which would have been extreme and severe, um, as, as we've seen from, from several other types of uh, actions that the Allies undertook. Uh, and then there was a uh, suggestion of combined operations. Um, 
um, uh, team. And, uh, and, and ultimately, uh, they decided that they would go with combined operations because they felt that they needed um, a large group, at least 12 to 15 people to carry out this task, had to be trained in, the, in, the, in demolitions, and they didn't feel that SOE at that time was experienced enough to be able to do it. And here's the crucial, here's the crucial, crucial important difference between Operation Freshman and, and Operation Gunnerside, the successful uh, um, sabotage action afterwards the following year, that the targets were different. And most people don't realize this. The targets were different. Uh, Operation Freshman's task was to destroy the sulks of heavy water and the capacity for making it. And that meant that not only were they going to destroy the stocks, they were going to destroy the uh, electroly electrolysis plant, but they were also going to blow up the generators for the hydroelectric plant. And that is a big, big task. You need a lot of people to do that, and you need a, a large quantity of explosives. So you need a lot of men to be able to carry their stuff and, and, and do that task. And Gunner's side, their task was only to destroy the heavy water cellar. So they weren't going to destroy the generators. So they could go in with a much smaller team, much lighter, in and out, and, and that's what they did. So the difference in the target was, uh, is, is crucial here for understanding how and why Operation Freshman happened, because you needed more men. 12 to 15 was seen as necessary, and they doubled that capacity in case one of the teams didn't manage to, to make it. So that's why we ended up with 30 uh, Royal Engineers who, who were selected for this task. So it was double, double capacity. But that's really why, uh, why uh, Freshman was developed the, the, the way it was. Um, the people who are involved in this, um, I just put this up just, um, just to show you the, uh, how, how it was actually organized at the time. So as I say, it came under combined operations and, uh, and uh, Lord Louis Mountbatten was the uh, head of combined operations at that time. So ultimately he was responsible for, for that uh, organization. Um, and then you had John Skinner Wilson, who was the head of SOE. He was heavily involved because it was an SO team, the uh, Grouse team that was involved in this. Uh, and then from the, uh, from the uh, combined operations or the RAF side, you had uh, Nigel Norman, and in the army you had uh, Boy Browning. But the guys who were really, really hands-on were obviously the people that worked for Mountbatten in the planning side, the military raid planners. And, uh, and uh, from the army side, it was uh, Lieutenant uh, Colonel Mark Henniker, who was, who was mainly responsible, the chief royal engineer at the time in the, in the airborne division. And, um, and then further down the line, you had Jens Anton Poulsen, who, uh, who the Norwegian, very famous Norwegian, who took part in Grouse and Gunnerside. Uh, he was the head of the SOE team that was parachuted in. And then Group Camp Captain uh, Thomas uh, Bruce Cooper, he was the, uh, the overall operational commander, if you like, and he actually took part in, in the raid in the Halifax that came back. Uh, Squadron Leader Wilkinson and Lieutenant Alexander Allen, he was the ground. Uh, the person in charge of the ground forces when they landed. So that gives you some idea of, of, of uh, who, who they were, but obviously there were a huge amount of people involved in the planning uh, of this planning and training, as we'll come to a little bit later. Uh, also briefly, I just wanted to, uh, I, I don't expect everybody to, to, to read this, of course, but uh, to give you an idea of the timing of this, the worries came in quite early after the occupation when, when the Germans started increasing capacity. But it only started to come to a real uh, decision to, to do something in, uh, in around September 1942. And remember, the raid actually took place in November. So it's not a lot of time. It's really not a lot of time. And that time frame gets even more compressed, as, as, as I'll explain later. Um, so the decisions, they started to talk to the chiefs of, uh, chiefs of staff and suggest this raid. And, uh, and, and one thing that, that always has surprised me once I looked into this more I, as I say, I, work, I used to work for an oil company in management, and I'm used to corporate committees and, uh, and uh, how decisions are made. It's incredible how like that was uh, during the war with the chiefs of staff and their weekly committee meetings and uh, the masses of minutes. And, who, you know, they come in, they get a half hour to pitch your, your project or your raid, and you're told to go away and come back with something better. And it goes on and on and on. It's so like a corporate decision-making structure. Um, that, uh, that, that actually surprised me. It's not like the movies. Uh, it's very much uh, a very business-like, very considered approach, and, uh, and uh, so that, that's something that I learned uh, doing this project. 
Um, so it was quite a long time before the actual men who were involved who, on the raid. It's quite a long time before they were named and, uh, and, uh, and asked to take part. So a lot of planning had gone into it before they were even, uh, they even got the chance to, uh, to, uh, to take part in the, in the training. Uh, so we're into uh, about the 19th of October. 19th of October when the Royal Engineers were pulled into a meeting at the cinema at, the, at, uh, at Bilford Barracks and addressed by Henniker and said, There's a, we're planning a raid and I'm looking for volunteers. And uh, anybody that doesn't want to take part, you know, you can walk out of here um, without anything being said. Well, I don't know how many of us would manage to stand up and say, you know what, I don't like the sound of that. Um, I think I'll pass on that one, <laughs> Lieutenant Colonel Henniker. I'll maybe next time. So, uh, so they were volunteers, but they were, let's say there was slight pressure on the volunteering process, I, I feel, but uh, not to take anything away from, uh, from, from these guys. They're, they're, they were outstanding. The 19th of October. Uh, and then on the, uh, on the 24th, that's when the uh, RAF air crews and glider pilots were, uh, were nominated, and they were nominated. Um, uh, the actual selection of the glider pilots is quite interesting and seen a lot of correspondence about it because there were two Australians involved and nobody could understand why they used two Australian glider pilots as opposed to people from the glider pilot regiment. Um, but it seems that these uh, Australians had actually trained with uh, the, the same group and they were as keen as mustard and they, they were very, they, they wanted to take part. So, uh, so, so they were selected as they were amongst some of the best glider pilots they, they actually had. So that timeline is really short when you think that the first discussion's actual official meeting with the Chiefs of Staff was uh, September, and then suddenly you're, uh, uh, it's 19th of October when the, the soldiers first hear there's something going on, and the air crew's 24th, and, uh, and, and here we are today on the 17th of November, and uh, that's almost the eve of the operation. Um, so, very short timeline. Um, very about who took part and the different nationalities, and, and to show what an amazing grouping. You had everybody represented here. So from the Royal Engineers, you had Scotsmen and Englishmen and Irishmen and Welshmen. Uh, for the RAF crews, you had Canadian, you had Australians, you had a Jamaican um, uh, and, and, and British. Uh, you had the four Norwegians for the SOE team. Um, it's just fascinating to see the, the the, uh, that's what it was like in the Second World War when you brought all these people together from every, every type of work that they did. Some were professional soldiers, some were you know, carpenters and joiners and, and, uh, and linoleum layers, and suddenly they're all together in this melting pot uh, uh, together on, the, on this raid. Um, I was fascinated at the size and age Totally fascinated by that. I mean, I've met a lot of military people in, in, in my time, and I always see most military people as about six feet tall and, uh, and very you know, big and, and confident. And uh, these guys, the average, age, average size is about five feet six. And they're carrying these insane weights of pack. <laughs> Absolutely, but this, this, was, this, was, this was really amazing for me to, uh, to, to think about it. That, you, you had uh, these, these young lads, they were all really young, they're all younger than my son is today, and I still think of him as a child, but, uh, but uh, you know, they, they were slight, their weight was really, they were really light. I mean, they're like half my weight, not quite, but, but um, just to put that together and have a look at these statistics and, uh, and see where they came from, what they used to do before the war, how, how tall they were, how young they were, um, yeah, it, it, it's so fascinating. So uh, that's the kind of thing I'm, bit of a geek when it comes to uh, data, and I just, I love things like this. It just makes it more human and more personal. So the, the units that were selected, uh, as I say, nine, comp nine field company, uh, Royal Engineers, uh, there were around 20 men selected from this particular unit. Um, quite a lot of the 20 were, had operational experience. They, they were experienced, uh, many of them had served with the British Expeditionary Force. Um, and uh, had, uh, had been at Dunkirk. Uh, the letter here is from, uh, is from Sapper Blackburn to his parents. Uh, it's such a fascinating letter because he goes through the whole campaign. He says, we just got back. All we have is what we're standing in. We had to leave all our equipment uh, back in, 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 uh, in France. 
and uh, and he said it was uh, it was an in it was absolutely incredible. He was driving backwards and forwards with an Ariaf lorry, delivering supplies and bringing wounded back and so on in, in Dunkirk area. Uh, but the thing that fascinated me was that at the end of it, he said, "I was having the time of my life." He's just a young, you know, twenty odd something, and he was alive, and uh, and he said, "I was having the time of my life." So um, it, that's why these letters are so fascinating and so important to preserve, because they tell you way more than the official records. This is the one young man's personal view of that uh, several months of, of what would have been absolute hell for many people. So, uh, so anyway, they, several of them had operational experience in, in Nine Field Company. The 261 Field Park Company, on the other hand, uh, they had uh, very little operational experience. There were 10 men selected from this unit, um, Lieutenant Allen, who was an overall command of the ground party, he had spent several years in bomb disposal. I have some amazing pictures of him in, in, in Plymouth, where my wife and I used to, used to live, and also in Bath. And he's right in the center of Bath with enormous bombs and him and all these men around uh, when, when the Germans uh, absolutely pasted Bath. And, uh, and, and so he had, although not operationally experienced, he had a lot of experience with, uh, with the explosive and certainly knew what danger was. Um, but most of the 261 uh, Field Park Company were relatively inexperienced. They were tradesmen, and uh, they were brought in because of their, their skills, uh, for you know, electrical skills and engineering skills. Um, so they, they didn't have as much experience. Uh, on the RAF side, uh, this, this is, is quite fascinating. So uh, we had two Halifax aircraft, and uh, this is the crew of Halifax A. This is the, the aircraft that came back. This is the only aircraft to return safely. Um, group Captain uh, Thomas Cooper on the, on the top left there, he was the man who was overall in charge. Uh, he was very experienced. He was a career RAF officer. He'd, he'd uh, been in the RAF since the 20s, so he was super experienced. A uh, bit of a wild uh, flyer by all accounts, flew at every single opportunity, even though it wasn't his turn. He would often bump people off uh, aircraft so he could actually fly it. Flew in coastal command, very operational, so, so he had lots of experience. Uh, the man standing next to him, Tom Conacher, who was the rear gunner, uh, he again was very, very experienced. And uh, uh, a fascinating little uh, story from him is that he was actually flying a, a two-seater plane as a gunner over the beaches of Dunkirk during the evacuation. So he was flying over the beaches when some of nine company were probably being evacuated out. So, you know, it's a small world. But he, he was in a two-seater aircraft in the, the rear with, uh, with his gun uh, flying uh, uh, protection. Uh, and then uh, squadron leader Wilkinson, uh, he was also very experienced. He was a pre-war pilot, uh, flying instructor. He uh, flew in the glider squadron at Imperial College, I found. Some great pictures of uh, the gliding club in Imperial College. Um, but he had a lot of experience. Uh, the other three, uh, they, uh, they had been flying for quite a long time. They were trained in Australia uh, in, the, in the Commonwealth scheme. But they had limited operational experience. They had only been on one or two and um, leaflet dropping raids up until that time. Uh, there's only six people there, and that's because there's a bit of a mystery about number seven. And, uh, and uh, originally was set up as uh, Flight Sergeant Watt, and we have one of his relatives here uh, today. Uh, but it looks like he didn't take part. And we don't know why, and, uh, and we don't know who did. Uh, there have been several stories about this. Uh, some uh, some uh, that we know are wrong, and some that I still have to find out. But amazingly enough, we don't actually know who flew as the flight engineer uh, in, in that Halifax when it came back. Uh, the second crew, Halifax B, um, most of them had very limited operational experience. They'd been on one leaflet dropping raid uh, or two. Um, so they, they really didn't have uh, much operational experience, apart from uh, this one guy here, uh, Flight Sergeant Buckton. Uh, I could write a book about this guy alone. Uh, just a young man, but he was one of the guys who helped develop the cross-Atlantic uh, ferry route, flying uh, American bombers over to, uh, to the UK. So he was instrumental in that. He then went on to uh, fly for a coastal command up in, based in RAF Wake, so very close to Skitton where they took off. And he took part on uh, at least two raids on the Tirpitz. So, uh, so he was the wireless operator, uh, originally a gunner, but he had a lot of experience. And then one slide I just had to include, 
was Albert Bochten in Hollywood. When he was in the States, the, the, uh, the RAF guys that were there were invited to Hollywood on a tour, and they met all these Hollywood stars. And uh, in the Imperial War Museum, if you, uh, if you, look, uh, if you look him up, you will see there's a, uh, an album of photographs in the Imperial War Museum. And if any of you are really interested, I highly recommend you go and have a look at that. It's a big, thick album. He's got pictures with, uh, with Jimmy Cagney and Betty Davis and a whole host of others, and they've all written messages to him. And apparently James Cagney sent cigarettes and stuff back to uh, his house uh, for years uh, afterwards, um, not knowing that he was dead, of course. Uh, so, uh, so that's a picture in a, in, a, in a film set, and Joyce and I watched that film at Christmas Eve last year. Uh, and it's not great, but, it was <laughs> <laughs> but I recognized the scene. So, but I just, I just like to add that one in, because I thought it was, uh, it was a very cool story. Uh, the glider pilots, uh, so, uh, so the um, uh, Davis and Fraser, they trained as pilots in, in Australia. And, uh, and listening to their stories as uh, how, the, how you get from Australia to the UK to take part in the fighting is, is very, very fascinating. So the um, uh, Australians were shipped, obviously, often to the States, to the west coast of the States. Then they were put on a train, a sealed train, because America at that time wasn't in the war and they weren't supposed to be transporting combatants anywhere. So they were in a SEAL train until they got to the Canadian border, and then they were uh, based in Canada, and then across Canada train to Halifax, and then put on another ship, and off they went to the UK. So it was a pretty torturous journey for, for a lot of these guys. And, uh, and uh, there are some really good descriptions of that trip, which, which are absolutely fascinating. Um, Peter Doig, he, uh, he worked at Glasgow University before the war. He joined the Cameronians, and then he, he was a uh, volunteer for the, for the glider pilot regiment. Um, and, uh, and Malcolm Strathdee, fascinating character, lots of articles written about him, uh, and, and well known as the, as the very first qualified army glider pilot. So, uh, so he, he, again, there's, there's books that can be written about, uh, about, about him. But uh, these were the four guys who were selected for this, and they were seen as... As, the, as some of the very, very best glider pods. You would need to be for, for, for this. Engineers, as I say, they had the meeting at, on the 19th of October at the uh, cinema where they were asked if they would like to volunteer. Uh, they started the uh, training two days afterwards and they spent about a week doing some uh, just general fitness training around Salisbury Plain, just hardening up. They were told they could stop uh, shaving and uh, getting their haircuts. And they were also told to remove all, uh, all insignia from their uniforms. Um, and uh, that created a few problems for them when they were in train stations and so on. People wondered, you know, who are you guys? You know, not shaving in army uniforms and we don't know which unit you're in. But that's what they were told to do because they basically had to, they were ultimately going to escape on foot. So they, they, they couldn't look like they were newly shaved British soldiers. Um, so the, the first week was there, then they moved to Wales, did about a week in the Brecon Beacons area, uh, doing mountain training, hardening up again, uh, map reading, um, carrying loads, and, 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 and basically hardening up. They had one and a half days. When I, when I read the account of one of the guys who was injured before the raid, he was on the whole training. And he talked about, we spent, oh, we must have spent a week, spent a week in the special training school with the SOE. But actually, they spent one and a half days. One and a half days. Uh, they did one of those shooting ranges, you know, you've, you know, the FBI used to use. You go in and targets pop up, and they did this, and they did some very specialist uh, explosive trainings on a mock-up of, of the hydroelectric plant that they were going to attack. But one and a half days is what they actually had. Uh, then they went up to a hydroelectric plant. Again, that was an afternoon. They saw this hydroelectric plant. One of the guys talked about being dragged up this hill by this 70-year-old uh, Scottish shepherd who was bounding ahead of them with his dogs, and they were like trailing behind them. And uh, so, so. <laughs> yes, thank you, thank you. Yeah, um, they've never forgiven me for dragging them up these, to these crash sites. Um, <laughs> and uh, and uh, so they did that, and then they had 40 hours leave, uh, and then they were back at Bulford, they would get their equipment, their escape uh, kits, and, and so on and so forth which were also quite uh, interesting, come back to that. Uh, they did some loading trials they, uh, they, um, uh, and uh, collected all the kit. They went to King's Cross London 
and then moved up to, uh, on the way up to Scotland. So around 29 days, 29 days was the time from the first meeting to the raid. But I would estimate, and I could probably work out exactly, I'd estimate that a significant chunk of that was spent sitting on a train going from one part of the country to another. So way less than, than 29 days in actual, actual training. Um. <coughs> uh, there's some uh, amazing artifacts preserved, some here in, in, in the Royal Engineers Museum, uh, some in the museums that I've worked with in, in, in Norway. And uh, I'm trying to compile a, a complete list of all the artifacts that are there so that we can maybe work on improving some of the, uh, uh, or, or making a, a, a bigger exhibition at some point. But I wanted to mention these boots here. Um, these boots are currently in my cellar. Um, uh, they, are, they don't belong to me, of course. They are donated by, uh, by uh, a Norwegian family who, whose family owned the farm where one of the gliders crashed. And so these boots were taken off one of the uh, soldiers when he was buried on their farm. Um, I'll come back to, to more about that later. But, but uh, the local farmer used these boots for about 30 years uh, afterwards. So good, good quality boots. Resold a few times, but good quality boots. And I think I know whose boots they were as well. So maybe I'll tell you after. Um, one thing I, I shouldn't forget, uh, you can see that there's ski trousers here, so everybody was equipped with that because they were going into uh, a, a winter area in Norway. But they also had, very, very importantly, they also had civilian, civilian clothes um, because the idea was that once the raid was done, they were going to make their way on foot to Sweden. And so underneath their uniforms, they had blue seamen's jumpers and blue skiing trousers. 34 men dressed the same. <laughs> it's God, I mean, even though you want to pretend that you're Norwegian I don't know a Norwegian civilian that wears a blue woolly jumper and blue ski trouser, but there you go. So that, that, was, the, that was the cunning plan. Um, and uh, and uh, they needed those jumpers, tell me, and uh, I can tell you. In the glider, they had to wear every piece of clothing they had, plus their sleeping bags to, to keep warm. But, as I say, that's, that's an important point. And, those clothes did become a case in, in post-war with the uh, war crimes trials. So it, it was actually important. Um, for the glider pilots, this was the, uh, probably the big success story. The glider pilot training was organized by, by a well-known uh, glider pilot, uh, squadron leader Davis. And uh, a lot of the, the tugging practice was with Whitley's, not with the Halifaxes, because the Halifaxes that they got um, were in really poor condition and were constantly being fixed. Uh, and so in order to get the hours they needed for the glider training, they used uh, Whitley's. Um, but they did uh, about 44 hours of, of, uh, of actual training, which was what they had planned to do. Every part of the training was completed uh, successfully. And, uh, and, uh, and it was written by the, uh, the people in charge that the glider pilots had been outstanding. They, they'd done every task, and they'd, they'd completed every, every piece of training. So that, that was a big success. Um, much more different with the, uh, the, the, the training part of the, of the RAF tug crews. Uh, they were supposed to have about a minimum of 50 hours uh, training, nighttime uh, towing, uh, navigational exercise, and so on. And if you read the official document in the National Archives, it looks like they got a little bit more than that. But then I discovered the pre report that was written before that one that's, that's, that's in the National Archives. And, uh, and um, what those 50 plus hours was, was the cumulative total of both crews. So actually, they only did half, less than half of the training they were supposed to do, partly because of uh, the airworthiness problems of the Halifax aircraft, always breaking down, had so many problems with these. They got really poor um, aircraft given to them. And, uh, and, uh, and the weather. The weather was against them all the time. So they got about 20 hours, actually, in, in actual training, and very little with uh, long-term towing, uh, long-distance towing and navigation. Uh, so that's, that, that, that's a fact. And we know this because we, we have, uh, fortunately, the, uh, several of the logbooks. One from, uh, from uh, Tom Conacher's family is, is shown here. And you can read through how many hours they actually did. And that's what put me onto this. So I, I saw the official report and said, 59 hours? That doesn't 
That doesn't compute. Look at the logbooks, and it's about 20. So, um, so not only did they have to have, have problems with the aircraft, they had limited uh, training time, uh, much less than they should have done. They also had to learn how to use new equipment, the direction finding equipment, the Rebecca Eureka system. Uh, here's a picture of the Rebecca uh, unit that's, that's here at the museum. Um, and of course, it didn't work in the end. Uh, so, so that's one of the main reasons they, they never did find the target. That they, but they had to train to use this. They didn't get nearly enough time to, to, to train to use this properly. So, uh, so that was the, 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 the training they had. Then you went on to the operational orders. There are, there's a huge document on the operational orders. It's so detailed to read every step of what you should do. And any of you who have been in the military, you will know that you can have a whole set of operational orders, but the minute your feet touch the ground, then everything pretty much changes uh, from that moment on. And so to actually follow that, I'd love to show you all these different pages and what Henneker wrote and, uh, and how they should behave and what they should say when they met somebody and all the little catchphrases they were told in Norwegian that if they came across a German soldier, they should put stones in their mouth and say they had toothache in the region, which, you know, maybe that would have worked, I don't know. But, uh, but we don't have time for that, unfortunately, just now. But it is all in the National Archives, and it just makes fascinating reading. If you ever get the chance to do that, it's, it, the material's there. Um, the maps they had of the facility were extremely good. They had inside people working there and who provided them with very, very detailed ground maps of the facility. So there was no problem there. Uh, but the challenge uh, was absolutely escaping. Uh, so there is the, uh, the outline of the escape route. That's the corridor that they were supposed to make. It's about uh, two, three hundred miles, depending on which, which route you took. Uh, this is winter. Remember, this is November. You're going through the mountains. Uh, these guys flew three and a half hours to the target in a glider at 10, 12,000 feet. Um, they'd have been sick as anything. They'd been freezing cold. They would have landed. They had a five and a half hour march on foot to the facility just to get there. Then they had to cross this bridge with the guards. Then they had to make their way in there. They were given 20 minutes, 20 minutes to actually put the explosives on and then escape in twos and threes into the mountains and head for Sweden. So I've been there many times. I have climbed those mountains many, many times. I know that area quite well. Um, it's a challenge in modern equipment and with skis, and these guys were on foot, they had no skis with them, and they couldn't ski anyway. So, uh, so all the training and preparation and everything to, to actually get to that point, and if they got to the factory, who knows? Um, I, I think there's probably a good chance they, they could have actually destroyed it, uh, what they were intending to, but to get to Sweden on foot in twos and threes, and uh, if you see the escape plan, I have a copy of it, uh, it's quite detailed, and it basically says, Okay, team two, there's three of you. You go to the first stream past the hydrogen pump, and then you go up for 300 feet, and then the stream splits. So you take the left fork of the stream and keep going until you get to whatever. You know they're going to be lost within five minutes. Even if you're really good at map reading, you're going to get lost real quick. And the Germans would have been all over it. There's like 34 guys running around the mountains after you know, blowing up the factory. So... Uh, I'm not sure how many would have made it to Sweden, maybe some. To personnel, so, uh, so one of the, uh, the second in command, uh, uh, Lieutenant Green, he was injured in a firearm accident and shot his finger off and he got infected, so he couldn't go. And, uh, and uh, Lieutenant David Methvin, 21-year-old, uh, George medal winner, he was brought in three days before the, uh, the operation was due to start, so he had none of the preparation whatsoever. And, uh, and uh, some of his family are here, and, uh, and uh, one of them supplied me with, with uh, this notebook, which is really fascinating. So this guy, this young guy, would suddenly have to come up to speed with an operation that had been planned for quite some time. And if you read the notebook, it tells you about the, uh, the blue polo neck jumper and the blue trousers and 10 days fags and, you know, and 10 days K rations and uh, on all the other bits and bobs. So you know it's freshman because the, the kit list it's pretty much identical to the printed one that I have from the, from the National Archives. So he's writing this down in his 1943 Royal Engineers diary. He's repurposed it and he's changed all the dates and he's filling this in. Absolutely fascinating. The night of the operation on the 18th, they had a, a, a nickeling flight, a leaflet dropping flight with both aircraft. Uh, they took a glider pilot in each one and they flew 
towards the target to try and see if the, how it would go, how the navigation would go. One plane uh, did it successfully. They reckoned they could identify the target. They dropped the leaflets in Oslo. No night fighter activity, no anti-aircraft activity. They got back fine. Second aircraft had massive problems with one of the engines. It, um, it seized up, so they had to turn around after, uh, after a couple of hours. And that's the, the, that's the entry there um, from uh, Alan Jones' uh, logbook. So not the best preparations for, for them either, and, uh, uh, but they, they, they decided to, to go for it the next day. So we're on to the 19th, and uh, what do people do on the 19th of November if they're going on a very high risk raid like that, then, uh, then everybody uh, starts writing letters. And um, Sapper Bert Leggett, he's 23 years old, and uh, so he was one who, uh, who wrote this. And this is so typical of, I think I've got about six, uh, access to about six, it's so typical of all of them. Their mom and dad, um, off on a raid, uh, you know, we talked about someone who was last on leave that I couldn't say anything about, and Washington Cup, which was the code name for the raid. It's actually real, and it was training for this. I can't tell you where I'm going. Um, the best of luck for the future. I wish you all the best of luck for the future, and I hope to see you at Christmas. Uh, and as I say, I've got about six, access to six. These are almost identical. Same sentiment every time. You won't hear from me for a while. Don't worry. I'll be fine, and uh, I'll... Uh, I'll see you, hopefully see you at Christmas. Don't be worried that you haven't heard from me. Very, very poignant. So, um, so when the raid happened, what actually, you know, what, what did happen? Um, despite the non-optimal weather, there was a lot of discussion about the weather forecast, uh, it wasn't great. Um, but the guys in Norway, the grouse team, had said that the past three nights had been as clear as a bell, and it was still clear on, the, on their last, uh, last call. And so they, despite the Norwegian weather expert back in Skitten saying you should wait for another day or so, uh, they decided because of the report from, from Norway was it said it's clear just now, they decided to go for it. And, uh, and, and so they took off uh, on the 19th on the evening. They were a bit delayed. Uh, one of the, te one of the uh, lights on one of the Halifaxes uh, malfunctioned, so the glider pilot couldn't position himself properly, couldn't see both the, the wing lights. Uh, so they had to, had to fly around, do a couple of circuits to see if you could make that work. And then the Rebecca Eureka system, or the Rebecca system failed, essentially. So uh, they, they couldn't use that. And then the intercom between the Halifax and the, and the tug, uh, the Halifax and the Glide on both combinations failed. So they had to use uh, Morse code to communicate. So they had, they had no intercommunication. One of the indicator lights on the Halifax was gone and the, and the Rebecca failed. Um, so they gave the glider pilots the option to abort uh, after takeoff. They took off, did a couple of circuits, and then the wheels dropped off of the, uh, the gliders with the little orange parachutes, and that was the signal that told everybody that they decided to, to go for it. So that, that was that. Um, in Norway, they were waiting for the, uh, for the aircraft. Uh, they heard aircraft noises very, very close by, uh, around 20 to 9 in the evening. Um, uh, at least one aircraft, but no gliders arrived. They were just sitting there waiting with a the flare path lit, but it was cloudy by this time, and uh, they, they, nothing came, so they, they, they knew that something had gone wrong. Uh, on the way back, uh, there was a faint radio message picked up by one of the stations, uh, very faint, asking for, uh, for a fix for home, uh, which they, uh, they think was from glider at Halifax B, and uh, at around uh, 20 to 12. And then there was a message from uh, Halifax A saying glider released in sea. Uh, and that was sent in open. Uh, it wasn't sent in code. It was sent in the open, which created a, a real uh, annoyance with, uh, with Group Captain Cooper. But, um, but uh, they lost the glider. And uh, then it returned about almost 2 o'clock in the morning. Um, so that was all the kind of new from the Allies' side. They, these faint radio messages. One aircraft was back, said they'd lost the glider. Uh, it'd gone through turbulence, uh, they'd been losing height, the tow rope iced up, uh, the glider came down, started to, to get stuck in the, in the turbulence of the, of the plane, and eventually it snapped, and, and that was it. And they assumed the same thing happened with, with the second combination. So uh, like Lord Mike Batten, he sent this mail to the Prime Minister, and uh, that's a copy of it here, and he, he just basically gave a 
short report on what had happened that uh, had failed, and uh, they weren't quite sure what had happened to the men. Um, but, uh, but clearly, a, a tragedy was in, was in the making. So of the four aircraft, only one came back. The next indication was, uh, was two days afterwards when the Germans released a news com communique that was uh, on Reuters. Uh, it was published in the British newspapers as well and basically said that three British aircraft had been forced down and, uh, and the sabotage troops that were on board had all been engaged and killed uh, to a man. And that, that's the information. And it was in all the European papers and it was in the British papers as well. And so the, uh, the, uh, the command... Uh, commanders, uh, Lieutenant, Henneke, uh, Lieutenant Colonel Henneke and others, they, they refused to countenance this. They assumed this was a ploy by the Germans to try and get them to react and say, you know, where are these 30 men or, or whatever to try and get some idea of how many they were and what their mission was and so on and so forth. But, uh, but tragically, they, they, it was, the truth wasn't far off what the, what the Germans said. Not quite. Uh, the, the truth was much worse, in fact. But that's the information they basically had on the Allies' side until they started getting reports from, from, from others. Uh, so that shows the uh, flight paths. We had a, a retired uh, Norwegian Air Force captain, Per Jonsson, who was uh, incredibly engaged in this. And he basically went and, and plotted out all, these, uh, uh, all, all the radio signals and, and the routes that they, they, they took. And so this is a diagram that's in the uh, museum in Vemork just now. And it basically shows how, how the, where the aircraft flew and, uh, and uh, where the aircraft uh, eventually ended up. So Halifax B, um, commanded by uh, Lieutenant, uh, uh, Flight Lieutenant Parkinson, the Canadian. Uh, so a local farmer heard this plane coming over. He knew it was British by the engine noise, flew low over his farm, the farm he was living in. Then he heard it circle round and come again much, much lower. And uh, it was so loud he went out and had a look and he saw it go over the farm and uh, then disappeared over the next hill, and then he heard the engine revs uh, go absolute maximum boost, so assuming, uh, assume that they realized they were about to fly into a mountain, and they just banged the revs on and tried to pull up, and then he just had this massive crash and, uh, and, and a flash in the sky, and so he knew that there, there was something wrong there. So him and a few other locals, they made their way up to the site, and it was just burning everywhere, and, uh, and unfortunately, bits of bodies everywhere, as, as you can imagine, a high-speed crash like that. And um, so they waited until first thing in the morning. They called the local sheriff, who was involved on the other side of the valley with Glider B, which I'll come to in a second, uh, and, uh, and um, informed him. He drove over with an interpreter. He was guided up to the site, had a look at it, uh, then reported to the local German army commander, and uh, they sent a, a group out there to take command of the site and... Uh, then they were told to leave, and the Germans had, had control of it. Um, they buried the guys very close to the crash, um, uh, very badly, and the locals complained a few months later because there were body parts here, and uh, it was just under a layer of earth. So eventually the Germans came up and, and, and buried them slightly better, where I'm standing right here. Uh, but one of the jackets that you see is in, uh, there's one here in, in the Royal Engineers Museum from that crash, and this is the second one that's in the uh, local museum in Norway. Uh, so this one here belongs to Flight Lieutenant Thomas, uh, who was the uh, navigator. And uh, we know that because le uh, pictures were found in the pocket afterwards, and uh, they were able to identify whose jacket it was. So they were all killed outright. Um, Glider B, on the other side of the valley, um, the first thing MD knew was a knock on the door of the local sheriff's house at about 2 o'clock in the morning, two soldiers in British uniform standing there explaining that they, they needed help and there'd been a crash and they had injured men. And, uh, and so what happened next is a bit of speculation. Uh, the sheriff said they discussed with the two guys that the only way they could help them because they'd already visited two other farms. So it was now known that there were British soldiers in the area. They basically decided they would have to inform the local garrison who would then come and arrest them and intern them or put them into a prisoner war camp. Um, what happened exactly, I don't know. But that call was made, and of course, as soon as the, 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 as soon as the army was alerted nearby camp, then the, they called the, the German security police as well. And so the, the local Gestapo were also informed that uh, there had been a crash and there were British soldiers there. Um, so uh, a detachment from the army camp was sent out. They walked up to the site. 
Uh, fortunately, a few local Norwegians got there before them and managed to burn a lot of the maps, uh, help them burn the maps and stuff like that. But the guys were all lying in their sleeping bags uh, in order. Three of them, the two glider pilots were dead and, and, uh, and driver Pendlebury was killed in the crash. But everybody else was more or less uninjured, uh, 14 of them. They were all in, in their sleeping bags and, um, and just waiting. Their arms had been set aside, so they were not intending to resist arrest. Uh, and then the Germans arrived and uh, took them down to the farm. And one of the local workers, he said that, uh, one of the local uh, guys there, he, he said that he just remembers them standing there. It was a tall, red-headed guy who must have been Lieutenant Allen because he was a six-footer. And he said they were just joking around and horsing about and play fighting. And, uh, and, uh, and as they were driven away in the German army trucks, they were making V signs out, out the back. Um, but the pictures here, that's, the, that's the, 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 the one on the top right. That's the actual site of the crash. And that little stone cairn is to the... Australian glider pilots, but down in the, in the uh, sorry, in the top right, in the bottom left, that's the actual glider. That's a picture of the glider taken by a German soldier the day after. And uh, on, the, on the bottom right, that, that is the German soldier. He's an Austrian who was a driver for the Luftwaffe. Uh, so his unit was told to go out there and pick up all the equipment and, and bring it down. So he took these pictures. So these are taken the day after the actual crash, which is absolutely amazing. Uh, so, uh, so then all 14 survivors were, uh, here, are, here are some of the guys, uh, they were uh, taken to the uh, German army camp a few miles away at, uh, at Schlettebe. Uh And uh, this is where it really got tragic. So they arrived about midday, so midday on the 20th, so the day after the crash, midday. Uh, there was uh, backwards and forwards between the German army uh, command as to what to do with them. The local commander was away for the weekend. This was a Friday. So he was off probably having a good time and could not be contacted. It's not mobile phone time we're talking about. And so was the second command. They'd been given instructions of what to do with saboteurs only a few weeks before. The Hitler order, this, uh, the commando order, had only been issued a few weeks before. So you're quite early in this process. I think they just got into a bit of a panic. They couldn't quite make up their mind what to do. They didn't want to get this Gestapo telling them what to do. So somebody somewhere just decided to take an executive decision. And once they'd established that they had explosives and uh, civilian clothes and equipment that was clearly meant for sabotage, they decided they should be classed as saboteurs and should be executed within 24 hours as per the commando order. So tragically, that is actually what happened. So around 4 o'clock in the afternoon, all the Norwegian civilian workers in the camp were, were uh, removed. Um, luckily for us, there were one or two they forgot about, so they were able to provide witness testimony after the war. But they were all removed, and, uh, and essentially um, uh, from that point, uh, one of the, one of the uh, Norwegian witnesses who was actually in the, in the kitchen area, he saw the soldiers starting to be led out. They were each flanked by two German guards, and they were walked down a track towards the edge of the camp, which is called the Burma Road or the Burma Vian um, in, in the region, which is on this map here, about 80 meters apart. And then they were shot one by one um, and dumped in a shallow grave uh, nearby. Uh, uh, so it's quite a, quite a we, we were there a few weeks ago with, with, the, with the relatives, and uh, it's quite a shocking sight to, to, to behold, to imagine them walking down that road like that, and they would have known from the first volley of shots what was about to happen. It took almost two hours. And according to the German eyewitnesses, the last guy was, was the, the youngest, the 18-year-old. So, horrible. So later that night, they were, um, they were uh, picked up from the shallow grave beside the uh, execution site. They were put in a lorry, driven out to uh, a nearby beach at a place called Brusand, uh, and uh, they were buried in secret. By, uh, by these Polish POWs under the command of the, the Germans. Luckily, a couple of local Norwegians were living in the area and they saw what was happening and they managed to mark the spot so they could inform the authorities afterwards. And you can see um, uh, that uh, they used local uh, Quislings after the war to dig them up and uh, they were taken back to that German army camp and, uh, and examined and then buried with full military honours in, uh, in uh, Stavanger. Uh, so it's a... Uh, it's, uh, Horrible story uh, in, in reality. Uh, Glider A, uh, similar type of thing. It, it broke off. It crashed in a much more remote area uh, up in the mountains in Filiostalin, 
and just right up there is, is where the glider crashed. Uh, and in the morning at daylight, three guys came down here, uh, Cairn Cross and Jackson and, uh, and Bonner, made their way to this farmhouse, tried to explain to the guy there'd been a crash, they needed medical help, this, this was a serious crash. They, this had gone in a high angle, lots of guys, there were eight people killed outright, but there, was, there were se severely injured people there. Um, the, guy, the farmer had no idea what they were talking about, but they were making airplane sounds and noises and calling for a doctor. And doctor in English is very similar in the region as well. So he understood they needed help. So he guided them down from up here all the way down this valley to uh, the farm at Hoheller, which had a telephone. And, uh, uh, it, and so it took them there, and then they called the authorities to say, there's, there's been an accident and we need help. Um, so they got hold of, uh, of the local sheriff, who happened to be, this is the actual local sheriff, but it was this lady, his daughter, Yordis Espidal. She was standing in for him, and she took the call. And at the same time, her brother, Life Espidal, he was there as well. So she called the police station in Savanger and said, uh, I've been called by this farm. There are people that we think they might be British, but we don't know. There's been an air crash. There's lots of injured. We need help. So they dispatched two uh, police officers from Stavanger to come and, and investigate and bring in the three guys that were at this farm. And, uh, and so that's, that, that, that's what they did. Um, but, of course, uh, the, the problem was that uh, by the time, by the, time the, uh, uh, the policemen got there and then talked to the three soldiers, they realized this is way bigger than they'd been told. They, they thought it was just three guys, not 17. And, uh, and, uh, and British uniforms, soldiers' uniforms, they assumed it was an, uh, an airplane, it was RAF people. So then the Gestapo were, were, uh, were, were told, and, uh, and uh, they were raging uh, at the fact that they weren't there on the spot at the time. So they organized a boat for the next day um, and, uh, and took a whole bunch of Gestapo people, Luftwaffe people, and German army uh, units, two boats went out there. And uh, so they went to, to the scene, they took the five soldiers who were all, uh, the three who had come to the farm, two more that had been carried down, took them back to Stavanger and put them in jail. And, uh, and then a Gestapo group and a Luftwaffe group went up to the farm to investigate what happened there. Uh, so they found four soldiers, uh, all in various stages of, of, uh, of injury. And, uh, and uh, this guy here, uh, Sapper Thomas White, he, he, was, he played a major role in this. He was, he was quite badly injured himself. He had a damaged eye and lost some teeth. But he was mobile, and so he could take them up to the crash site and, uh, and, and, and guide the, uh, the Norwegian helpers to try and get the, the, the last seriously injured down to the farm. Uh, but I wanted to, to also mention this, this notebook, which I found in the National Archives. And this no notebook is from the police officer, the uh, Norwegian police officer that was there. Totally fascinating, because he had asked Thomas White to write the names of everybody that was involved. And so this is his writing. This is Thomas White's writing here up in this part. And you'll notice here, uh, then the policeman wrote, and uh, two pilots don't know their names. So the soldiers didn't know the names of the glider pilots. They'd never met them before until that, the night they took off. They trained separately, so they didn't know them. Uh, and then they, he, he finishes with a list of the weapons that he, the policeman had gathered up, because obviously he would be accountable for anything, and uh, so he, he had those. So that's a fascinating little document, and it shows he didn't know the names of everybody that well. He would have had his mates, uh, but others he just kind of knew, even because they'd only been together for, for a few weeks, so he didn't know everybody intimately. He didn't know all their names, didn't know the spelling particularly. Um, but but uh, I just find, you know, to, to see a notebook with, with his writing and the Norwegian policeman's writing is it, just so poignant. So they were all eventually uh, taken down uh, to uh, Stavanger. And, uh, and to this uh, prison here, Prison A, which was run by the Gestapo. It's, it's right uh, near the center of Stavanger. Uh, so all nine of them were in there uh, at that time. Uh, there were at least three that were very, very seriously injured. Um, stretcher cases, uh, and uh, the other six were, were more or less injured, but able to, able to walk. Um, what happened next is, 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 is the most gruesome part probably, of, 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 the, of the whole uh, freshman story, that for some reason, uh, the Gestapo uh, in Oslo decided that only five should be sent for further questioning to Oslo, and the other four should be disposed of. Um, but fortunately for, for history and for us, 
Before that happened, the Gestapo sent a senior officer from Oslo to the prison to interrogate them there. And he took a Norwegian guy who was a double agent as far as they were concerned. Um, but this guy had been parachuted into Norway uh, only a few weeks before freshman. He'd been captured more or less instantly and had managed to persuade the Germans that he would work for them and, uh, and act as a double agent. So he, he took this guy, the, uh, the Gestapo agent, took this guy to the prison. So he wrote a report on what happened because he managed to escape back to the UK only uh, a few months afterwards with his wife, apparently. Um, but he escaped back and wrote some detailed reports for SOE about meeting all nine guys in the prison. Otherwise, we'd have had almost no idea what happened. Uh, so, so that was, uh, he described the state of their injuries and how badly they'd been treated and no medical care and so on, so it, incredible. So then uh, the five were dispatched off to Oslo uh, and uh, to Grini. Uh, the four others uh, were basically murdered in, in, in the, uh, by the Gestapo. Uh, so these are the four guys here. Only got a picture of, uh, of uh, Sapper Smith when he was a young lad. I'm still looking for an adult picture of him. Um, but it was, it was, they didn't know what to do with them. Three stretcher cases and one in, in, in poor shape. The war crimes trial said they asked them how they should dispose of them. And so the head of the local Gestapo unit told his officers to shoot them. And they actually refused. They said they're, in, they're on stretchers and we're not doing it. Um, they'd probably kill them in other ways, but they weren't going to do it. And, uh, and so uh, the head of Gestapo, Wilkins, and, uh, and uh, he talked to uh, uh, a Luftwaffe doctor, Dr. Sealing, who's, who's pictured here, and, uh, and, uh, and a couple of others, and they came up with a plan to kill them by uh, injecting them with morphine, overdose of the morphine. And, uh, and that's essentially what they tried to do. And it just went horribly wrong because uh, they kept doing it, and the guys would not die. They just would not die. And, uh, and what actually happened is disputed because uh, in the war crimes trials, they all blamed each other for all the things that happened next. I have a lot of pictures that were taken, I've shown two here, which are recreations that were done for the war crimes trials of the actual people. So this guy here is Dr. Sealing. That, that's the real guy. And this guy here is uh, Eric Hoffman, and he was a Gestapo driver. He's just a driver. And he admitted shooting one guy, the, the last one, uh, the, the, the day after. So he admitted it. Uh, but the other three, they said they were strangled, they were stamped on their throats, there was all kinds of things. But nobody actually really, really knows because they all blamed each other for it. But whatever it was, the fate was horrible. Uh, they killed the four of them, and, uh, and they were taken out to sea the next day, wrapped in, uh, in, uh, in uh, ropes and rocks and, uh, and weights and dumped uh, at sea in the deepest part of the fjord between Stavanger and the island of Fitzai. Uh, so they are the only four that have no grave. They were, they were dumped there. Uh, the other five, they were taken to the uh, prison camp at Greeny uh, near Oslo. And, uh, and I managed to find the prison record. This is up here. So this is the official Norwegian Greeny prisoner record. So I can tell exactly the day and time they were signed in to the prison. And I know exactly the time they were, they were signed out, and, and it says they were sonder, uh, which means special prisoners. So they were held in the isolation block in Haft, and, uh, and, uh, and, and it also says skut, which means they were shot uh, at the end of it. And uh, what that also tells you is the person that wrote the register was Norwegian, because it's not in German, it's in Norwegian. So we had a Norwegian secretary or helper that actually wrote the register. Uh, so it's another little thing you can find out if you, if you, if you know the language. But the guys were put into two cells initially, and then on Christmas Eve they were reunited into one cell. And, uh, and we, we know this because uh, although they were in isolation and they never met any of the other prisoners in Haft, in that block, you never met anyone else. You were, uh, even when you went for a shower, you only went to cell at a time. Um, but they devised this amazing communication system through the air vents in the bottoms of, uh, at the wall of all the prison cells. So every night they talked to each other through these air vents. So all the Norwegian prisoners in that cell block knew who these guys were and what they, you know, where they came from and what they did before the war and whether they were married and so on and so forth. So it's just amazing the detail that comes out. 
And at Christmas, they got extra food. For some unknown reason, the British got better food than the Norwegian prisoners. And so one Norwegian wrote a letter back to this guy's parents after the war, thanking him for all the really nice cheese and tobacco, because he strung it in a little bag and hung it out the window of his cell to the cell below. And that this guy sent a letter at the end of the war thanking him for giving this extra food at Christmas. So we've got several of those letters uh, that, that were sent after the war with all these little details. But the comforting thing in, in, in some ways is that they were not alone. Although they were, they were together in the cell, but they, they did talk all the time, every single day, uh, several times to the Norwegian prisoners. So they, uh, horrible situation, but they, they were not alone. Um, so, so that's maybe a little bit of comfort. January 1943, uh, around about the uh, 17th of January, a decision was made by the uh, Gestapo head in Oslo that they were to be executed. No idea why they suddenly decided to do this. Um, that, that's, that's lost in time. The guy who was responsible, he killed himself at the end of the war, so we'll never know what he was going to say. But, uh, but the local head of what's called the Sonderkommando, which is the execution squad that the Gestapo used, uh, was this guy here, Oscar Hans. Uh, he had a group of about 30, 40 uh, people in the Gestapo headquarters in Oslo who were like filing clerks, drivers, you, know, you name it. They didn't use any of the Gestapo officers. They just used uh, this motley assortment of, of guys as their second hobby, if you like, shooting people, and um, assembled them, uh, told them that the next day there was going to be uh, uh, an execution. Uh, they were to meet. They were met at midnight. They were driven out to the prison. Prisoners were handed over by the local commandant, and, uh, and uh, they were driven to uh, Trandum Wood, which is in the north of Oslo. And, uh, and horribly, they, they, uh, they were sitting in these trucks. They were blindfolded. They had uh, German uh, um, coats with fur collars because it was freezing cold. Their hands were bound, um, uh, but the uh, one German witness said that he remembers the coat fell off one guy, and he lifted it up and put it on his shoulders. Um, and the guy said, thank you very much, and, and they were sitting in the trucks like that. But then they had to sit there for a while because Oscar Hans, when he got to the site, uh, he went to the grave that had been dug the previous day uh, by a, a, one of his squads, and it wasn't deep enough. And so he sent them back again to, to dig it deeper. So they had to sit there in the trucks for another couple of hours while these guys dug the trench even deeper. Uh, after that, they were led one by one, uh, or, and, and, and to, by two soldiers to, to the grave, they're blindfolded. They'd been told they were going to a meeting with some uh, Luftwaffe officers who wanted to ask them technical details about uh, the raid and the equipment. And the reason they were blindfolded is because they were going through a military area. So they had no idea, um, at least they hadn't been told, that they were going to be executed. And uh, they were also told that uh, they'd be brought to attention and, uh, and, you know, when these officers arrived. So they were lined up by this uh, previously dug grave, along with a sixth man, Abel Seaman, Abel Seaman Evans, who had been captured after a raid on the Tirpitz. And for some reason, they'd lumped him in with, uh, with a job lot of execution. So the six of them were standing there. Uh, Hans shouted, Achtung, and that was the command to fire. So they were shot instantly. Three men per, uh, per, uh, per soldier. And, uh, and they were killed instantly. And uh, there, uh, something I forgot to mention about the other, the other executions at, uh, at Schletterbe. Uh, that was a, a squad shooting one man, uh, but they had probably never done that before. And uh, the, the, uh, the NCO that was in charge of that, he then shot each of the men through the head um, uh, there. But in this case, these guys had done this many times before, three, man, three men per prisoner, and there was no requirement to, to do this. And you saw that after the war. There was no evidence on any of the... Uh, the bodies when they were recovered that anybody had been shot in the head, whereas the other ones in Schletterbo had all been shot in the head. So, uh, so uh, they, they were found at the end of the war um, and uh, reburied in Oslo West uh, Cemetery, along with, uh, there were almost 200 Norwegians executed in the same place during the course of the war. <coughs> so these are some of the men who took part. They were all tried uh, in, in the war trials. Uh, I find these photographs fascinating because then you can see what people were really like. 
You know, you have an image of a Gestapo guy and what have you, but they're just, these guys were all the same. They were bakers, they were, some of them were policemen before the war, they were all kinds of other things, and, and this, was, this was their role through the war. Um, and this one I find, you know, fairly chilling. It just, this, this is the statement he made during his, uh, his, his trial. He just said, I arrived back about 12.30, handed in my machine pistol, went to my office, reported my superior I'd been on night duty, and uh, asked to go to my billet and, uh, and put on my clothes and went to my billet. That's my task done, and there's no more to say about it. Just kind of chilling, but that's how they saw it. So, um, so uh, very close to the end, uh, there were a whole bunch of war, crime, war crimes trials afterwards. Um, uh, if you were tried early after the war, then the chances are your sentence would be much more severe. The later it went, uh, then it became more lenient. Um, uh, but uh, Sealing and Hoffman and another guy, Fireline, were, were found guilty of the murders in the prison in Stavanger. Uh, Sealing was, uh, was uh, shot uh, in Oslo at uh, Akersus prison. Uh, Hoffman, he was sentenced to be hanged. Hanging is illegal in Norway at that time. Uh, still is, obviously. Um, so he was taken to Germany and hanged uh, in, in Germany um, by Alfred Pierpoint, who the very famous executioner. So he was hanged by him. Um, on, the, on the Glider B guys who were executed at Schletteve, they that was an army command thing. And so the British authorities decided very early they weren't going to prosecute the firing squad. Uh, they didn't waste much time trying to find them. They wanted to prosecute the senior military command that was responsible. Uh, so they tried Falkenhorst, who was overall command of the German forces, and they tried the two uh, military uh, commanders of the area. One of them died of cancer before he could come to trial, uh, but both the others were sentenced to, uh, sentenced to prison, found guilty and sentenced to prison. Uh, Oscar Hans, the head of the Sonderkommando, he was uh, sentenced to 15 years uh, prison, as were most of the firing squad, the nine that they actually caught. But they were all out of prison in 1953-54. Uh, so they were all released and went on to their, their lives after that. So only the, the two were executed. One guy who was going to be tried, he hanged himself by his underpants in the prison at Akershus before he came to trial. So, um, so that's basically the story. It's, uh, to me, it's a story of uh, incredible courage by these young guys, and, and uh, the task they had ahead of them was, was unbelievable. Uh, the first time they were doing some of this stuff, and it ended so tragically for, for so many of them. And the impact it had on their families as well, because they were given almost no information. Some of them didn't find out until long after the war what had happened. And, uh, and, uh, and I find that human tragedy, uh, not just them, but also the, the, the families. Um, but anyway, that's, that's what I have for you today. As I say, as I told Rebecca, I could talk for at least 43 hours on, on this subject, but I think that's probably I'm a little bit over my time, I can see. But uh, hopefully that was of interest to you, and, and thanks for your attention. Thank you, Bruce. That was fascinating. Do we have any questions? Yes. Yeah. Uh, just one question. Do you know what kind of gliders they were in use? You showed horses. Yeah. I'm the... not sure if horses were actually in yeah. service. Yeah. Point. Yeah. They were horses. No, horses. Yeah. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Only 15 people. Uh, yeah. 15 and two two, two pilots. pilots. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But they would have had a massive equipment in there with them as well. They, they were. Their pockets were full of explosives. They had lots of other stuff with them, and uh, their dinghy, and uh, yeah. Uh, I've seen a picture in the Imperial War Museum collection of these guys sitting there in the uniforms and the rifles held up, and there's lots of space in there. Definitely wouldn't have been like that. They had every piece of kit and massive packs and lots of explosives and so on. So, yeah, they were horses, though. Yep. Uh, not a question, just a couple of comments, if I may. Um, I remember discussing this with Adrian Conker many years ago, yeah. <clears throat> and um, he, of course, had flown out there the night before yeah. with the, uh, the route as it were. Yeah. He was very much against the raid, yeah. because it had almost no chance of success. Mm. And it was meant back to have insisted the raid went ahead for all sorts of strategic reasons. Yeah. But it was, it was very clear when I was discussing it with Conker that he still had... Um, immense regret, even uh, um, great regret, 
and feeling of guilt yeah. for having allowed the raid to go ahead. Yeah. Um, and we discussed the <coughs> inadequacy of the equipment. But we discussed the escape plan, um, which was basically, when you've done that, go to Sweden. Um, and oh, by the way, it's the beginning of the Norwegian winter. Yeah. But I think the immense inspiration that you know those of us who came after um, took from that raid yeah. was the spirit of the boys, who knew it was a one-way ticket. Mm. Uh, but they, when you're that age, you're invincible. Sure. And they <coughs> said basically, as we used to, just get us there and we'll sort it out. Yeah. And. You know, one was immensely inspired by their um, spirit. Yeah. Um, I think that uh, an awful lot of comment has been made about, it was very unfortunate, things that went wrong, the Eureka and things like mm. that. It was the longest glider tow that had ever been attempted. Absolutely, yeah. Um, there were all sorts of things that were brand spanking new. Mm -hmm. So it was no surprise that it didn't work, but it was, it was bad luck. Mm. It didn't work. Yeah. I think a, a lot of comment has also been made about um, the cruelty of the human side of it. Well, that's always the case when young men are killed. I, there was a war on, and I, I, I don't have too much of a angst, if you like, mm. against the Germans for shooting them, because there was a war on, and that was their, that was their duty as they saw it. Mm. But I think that... Um, the, the thing that comes through out of the whole race was the determination to give it a go. And if we succeed, fantastic. Yeah. If we don't, well, <laughs> you know, it won't be for the one to try. Sure. And uh, of course, <coughs> the first parachute scorer should have done the raid, but they yeah. were earmarked for that's, the that's, that's correct, yeah. And uh, I had a lot of contact with the old boys from first parachute squadron. Until there's only one left now, but mm. over over many years, and um, they were just angry that they'd been held back because they were on the way to North Africa. North Africa yeah. So you know the spirit of the airborne forces mm. was nurtured at this time, yeah. and it's still there today. Mm. No, that's that's excellent points, and and and, and so true. Um, I mean, it, it was in a way. Uh, as you said, the, it, it should have been another unit that was was doing this. And one of, one of the problems that occurred was that they didn't decide until really, really late in the planning whether they would use gliders or paratroops. So they needed people who had done their parachute training. And, and luckily, there were enough people in the in the nine and, and two six one companies that had done their parachute training that they could use for this. But it was really, really late in the process before they finally went for gliders. And um, but that's that's why they were selected in the absence of the of the of the. Of Olka did tell me. Uh, <coughs> side, I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> that uh, he was a big fan of nine field companies. Yeah. Because he'd been with them and he'd seen them in Dunkirk. Yeah. And um, when he was told to form airborne forces, he formed up nine field company and said, "I need people to transfer to yeah. uh, gliders." And you know, some of you to be parachute trained. And almost to a man, they said they weren't going to do it. <laughs> so he said, so I sat with the OC, put another OC in, and they all volunteered. <laughs> <laughs> Well, one of the one of the other points which uh, which is important to understand is the, that that uh, the way that the operation was planned to actually attack the factory itself. Uh, there is only one access point. Uh, it's a very narrow bridge, which is guarded at both ends. Uh, the gunner side team, because it was a much smaller team and also very mountain experience, knew the area at the back of their hands. They found another route in. They went down the ravine and, and up the other side. You'd never got 34 men to do that, so they would have had to go across that bridge. And I, I guarantee they would have come in contact with the Germans. And the minute they had come in contact, the garrisons would have been, and there would have been a firefight. There's just no way of avoiding it. So the idea that 34 men would be able to go in, remember they'd have, they would have to hold all the workers in the, in the, in the turbine room uh, to one side and guard them, lay the explosives and try and get away. But they would have been, they would have been in action. There's just no way you could have done it otherwise. And so it would have been different no matter what. Once you're in a firefight, then... 
and trying to get 34 people away. Yeah. So they may have done it. They may have been able to set the explosive, but they couldn't. They couldn't have got away uh, as cleanly as the gunner side team did. Please. Just ask about the um, the grouse. Yeah. <coughs> Yes, yeah, so the grouse guys, they basically retreated into the mountains and uh, overwintered. Uh, there are some amazing books written about all of them. And, uh, and then they joined the gunner side team when, when, uh, the following year. So, uh, so they had a pretty, uh, pretty hard winter, um, scraping reindeer skins for stuff to put in water to try and make some kind of soup. Yeah, they were, had a, but yeah, they, they, they retreated to a cabin and overwintered and then joined the gunner side team next. Amazing guys, amazing guys. We met the son of Knut Haugland uh, when, we were, when we were in Weimark, and uh, he had some great stories to tell about his dad. Yeah. yeah. Hi, um, thank you very much, Bruce. I, I, I may have missed it in your presentation, but um, where was the actual planned landing spot? Uh, so it was, it was um, near uh, one of the lakes up <coughs> where, where we actually went and uh, visited uh, on, the, on the trip, up near the Hardanger Vida. Um, uh, center, so it, it's about a five and a half hour walk in from there. So it's higher up, and you would have walked down the valley and and, so and to, flat. yeah, they uh, they, that was one of the big struggles they had, and they they found these uh, marsh marsh areas which didn't have any trees growing on them, quite quite extensive. So they they would have made ideal uh, landing sites. So that's why they sent grouse in to have a look and scout out something that's big enough to land a couple of horses. Yeah, Thank you. Mungo. Yep. Um, when you showed the map, and I know we're not here to go into the detail, yep. but I was fascinated that both Halifax planes and the riders actually touched the same point on the map. Mm. And it's always troubled me that they got pretty much to the plateau, yeah. and they both decided not to let the riders go, and yeah. they were in the right spot. Yeah. So, and, and, <coughs> Story goes that they didn't know where they were, mm. therefore they couldn't let the gliders go. Yeah. That strikes me as fear of failure. Mm. You only get one shot at this, yeah. and they got there. Yeah, basically, you're, you're right. They were, they, they, the navigators had done an outstanding job even to get them within it, because remember, the, the Rebecca Eureka system failed, and so they had no. Uh, guidance system other than dead reckoning to, uh, to, to use. And the fact that they actually got so close, and definitely one plane definitely flew over the area because they, they heard it. The fact they got so close is a, a testimony to the, the skill of the navigators uh, anyway. But, um, but basically, standing orders were that you have to be able to see the landing site, and they didn't know for sure. They just thought they were in the vicinity. You have to be able to see the landing strip. Because the gliders, remember, you're in a mountainous area, you release a glider. If you're away from the actual landing area, there's a tiny, tiny little area that's flat that you could land in. Otherwise, you're going to smash into rocks or mountains or lakes or whatever. I just want to add, though, um, surely the only plan B was to try and get home. Yeah. Well, that was never going to work. No, well, they, they got close to the coast. Um, but the problem was the cloud, they had to go through the cloud. And once you go through the cloud, you get moisture on the tow ropes and they start to ice up. They were using so much fuel. And uh, I mean, the, 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 I know the pilot, uh, certainly the Halifax A pilots realized that they were going to struggle to get back anyway. Um, and so there was, uh, there was discussion about whether the glider was actually released or not. But, um, but I think uh, it's clear from what they found, they found the broken tow rope. So uh, the local farmers found it and used it for years, uh, you know, towing stuff from their tractors. So, uh, so I think that that's, that is what happened. And we and we do know that when you do get icing on on the on the, on the rope and your glider is going to start come down, the weight, the whole it's it's a really heavy weight when it starts to ice and gets very thick, and very brittle. And then once the turbulence, once you get into the slipstream of the Halifax, you're you're bouncing around all over the place. So you can't stay above it anymore. So, uh, but yeah. I, it's, it's one of those things, they, they, as I said, the navigators did a great job. They got them within the vicinity, but they could not see the landing area. And it's such a mountainous area that the risk of releasing the glider, I don't know. Yeah, hindsight's a wonderful thing, but uh, I, I, I don't think there's any way they, they would have released without seeing the flare path. Yeah? What was the plan 
if they've landed successfully, mm. deal with the gliders? Uh, so yeah, that's a great question. So there, there was a huge amount of discussion about that. Uh, initially, they, um, they didn't think they would have enough time to do it the same day. So then they brought in, uh, I can't remember his name, but, uh, but a very famous camouflage expert um, who basically went through how they could dismantle the glider, get the wings off, and they all had this huge thing of muslin that they were supposed to pull over the gliders and, and try and hide it. But they reckoned any German plane going over the next day, they would see. Uh, that something was there. So they decided against that. So they were basically just going to leave it. Mm -hmm. yeah. But yeah, they, 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 there was a big discussion about that. Um, yeah. Okay, well, thank you very much again. I think um, if anyone is interested, as I say, if you go through that door, you're in our World War II galleries and you can see um, the display that we have on, on the operation. If members of the family would like to stay back here for a second and, and let everyone else go, that would be perfect. Um, and I'd just like to finish off by saying thank you. I'm sure when you published, your book will be on sale here in the museum. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, Good to hear. Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. And, and thank you very much for, for that. Yeah. It's fascinating, fascinating. Thank you. If anybody's interested, I have a little photo album of uh, some of the pictures that the families have sent me and stuff I found in the archives. So if anybody wants a wee look at that, you're, you're, you're welcome. I'll put it there as well.